Hey legends, and welcome back to the least knowledgeable sim racing channel, where we're doing a refresher on one of this channel's earliest videos. Earlier this year, this channel sprung onto the scene with comparison videos between R Factor 2 and Automobilista 2 in its then early access state, and between R Factor 2 and Assetto Corsa Competizione respectively. At the time, it didn't make much sense to do a three-way comparison, namely because Automobilista 2 had no GT3 content and it was still working through many teething issues in early access. The great news is that over the last nine months there have been a tremendous amount of developments across all three simulators. We're finally in a state where we can even-handedly compare all three simulators using very similar content. The original idea was to compare AMS2 to ACC as a two-way shootout to finally round out our trilogy of comparison videos. But given the state of all three simulators, it seemed like far more fun to simply do a total refresher and compare them all side by side. Before we get into the comparison, be sure to check that you're subscribed to this channel to receive future sim racing news and reviews, including of course a bunch of races I'll be running with the community over 2021 and hopefully documenting thoroughly with future videos. If you're interested in partaking in any of these, be sure to check the sign up link down below. For this comparison, we'll be using the McLaren 720S at Imola across all three titles. The advantage of this track and car combination is that all three simulators feature it natively, as official content. To add to this, the track in R-Factor 2 and AMS2 are largely identical as both were created by Reza. I created rudimentary setups for each game, trying to tweak the car to be as drivable as possible for my specific driving style. The goal was to be as fair and flattering to each title as possible, driving them all in the manner they want to be driven. During the laps, I'll be narrating the experience of driving each sim, after which we'll break them down across some general criteria such as graphics, sounds, physics, accessibility and multiplayer, then giving our final verdict as to which is currently the tightest overall package as a GT3 simulator. Here we are in the mighty ACC, the current de facto overall king of GT3 simulators as described by the amount of market share it has as well as the amount of real life GT3 drivers who swear by it. So one of the first things you notice about ACC coming out of the pit lane here at Imola is that it has a very weighty feel to the physics. As the engine spools up and you start to hit the, the limiter up, soaring towards the, the first turn, you notice that it has arguably some of the best sounds in all of sim racing, potentially right up there with the Dirt Rally series, as this McLaren just absolutely growls its way towards the S. Now, this is where the physics really come into it, because one of the drawbacks about ACC, as described in many of my prior videos, is its limit behavior. And part of said limit behavior is the way that it feels going over the anti-cut, going over the sausage curbs, the way it feels at extremes when you lose traction on the rear tires, when you, when you start to basically slip the car. Now this is something that's substantially improved over the course of the last, well, two years essentially, ever since the game came out of early access. One of the main things that's continued to improve is the amount that you can push the car. So it's gotten ever closer to life you can slip the car ever more, you can get away with, with ever more stuff, you can get a little bit more expressive in your driving style. Now coming up to the chicane here, you have to be very, very careful about the anti-cut because these mid-engine cars are extremely allergic to it. This is something that we'll compare very viscerally between all three simulators because the way that they handle that chicane and those anti-cut curbs is very specific to each one of them. Now, in ACC, it's always been very much about perfect driving lines. You have to come in, trail brake to the apex, and only accelerate right after. If you accelerate too early, you will understeer out. As such, it's always been a great platform to train somebody who's new to driving, or GT driving specifically, about how to drive a car in the quote-unquote textbook perfect way. So as we come up, we're finishing our outlap, going in for our hot lap now. I have slightly tuned this car to, to match my driving style, tried to make it a little bit more pivoty to get through these corners without losing quite so much time. We're of course flat out on the throttle throughout this section, maximizing the track geometry as much as we can. Now unfortunately we can't mount these curbs like we can in the front engine cars like the AMG or the, the Lexus or what have you. But as you can see, a little bit of slip on the rear, easily corrected now. This is something that's very, very new to ACC. Every incremental minor new update has helped it on the limit 
ever so much more. As we come up here, one of the interesting things about this corner is that you get the mid-corner understeer due to the camber shift. You can see the car sliding out after to be very, very late on the power there. Very late apex. Very, very stable through Aqua Minerale here, but... No problems as we go through. Pretty decent tune of the car. Nothing esports worthy, but of course enough to get us through with a relatively speedy lap. Coming up to the chicane, let's see how we can handle it. Yep, just enough. Just as much as we can get. Maybe two wheels on the sausage. Not too much more than that. Can't go straight over. No flying lines like we can get in the Camaro. No American lines to be had here. These, of course, being Italian flags on the curbing, so <laughs> not much of a place for the American line. Ah, as you can see, that was almost an R-Factor line through there as I kept the, the wheel in the middle and actually rotated the car on throttle through the corner. Now, unfortunately, in ACC, you do still lose a lot of time doing this, being one of the main disadvantages of its driving style. As we set a 141.8, which is... Uh, Entirely unremarkable, but I think speedy enough to get us an idea of how ACC handles on the limit. So, revising that lap very quickly, the general feel of ACC is that of a simulator that is very weighty, very connected to the rear, one that has a lot of nuance in the force feedback, especially if you have a direct drive wheel. Now, the disadvantages come in again at the limits when you fly over the anti-cut, when the car bounces and then hits the ground, or let's say when the car slips too much, it still has this tendency to go into these lumbering, hard to recover slides, well, not so much hard to recover, but maybe slow to recover slides where you find yourself seesawing at the wheel more than a real life driver might in order to get the car back on track without losing too much time. Now, this is a criticism that was echoed very recently by Niels Hosinkveld, and I fully back his criticism of this handling model. While it's relatively minor in the grand scheme of things, it's amazing to see Kunoz continually putting in work to get around it, and I certainly hope to see it overcome entirely come the next year or two. Now before we move on, we're going to take a quick look at the car setup just so you guys can compare for yourselves how the setups look between the three titles to achieve relatively similar handling or at least a very drivable handling style. Here we are in the ACC setup for the McLaren 720S. It's heavily based off the default aggressive presets. You're not going to find anything otherworldly different here because those settings are already pretty close to ideal, at least for my driving style. So the main thing I've tweaked is the PSIs. You kind of have to tweak that based on the, the weather conditions, your driving style. My goal is mostly to keep them between 27.5 and 28 PSI during the actual course of the race or the drive. The toe and the camber settings are all very similar to the defaults, camber being maxed as it is on the default setup. With the electronics, we've got the TC all the way back to one to help us really pivot the car on throttle, especially around some of those hairpin corners. Now, in some of the tracks, this can make the car feel a little bit unstable, but in this one, it just kind of provides the perfect application of power that we need while still maintaining that kind of understeery controllable character. In terms of fuel, we have 12 litres, enough for three laps. In terms of the brakes, we've got them set to one, which is generally recommended if you're doing sprint races. You can see these are the setups in terms of the mechanical grip. Nothing particularly outlandish going on that I can see. I've just tweaked the bump stop ranges a little bit. Potentially the brake bias, depending on how you like to drive. The dampers have been tweaked ever so slightly to provide bell graphs in the Motec histogram. And this is the aero. I believe I may have reduced the brake ducts by one front and rear and possibly reduced the ride height on the rear just to make the car a less liftoff oversteery. So with that said, let's move on to our factor two. All right, so for a big change of pace, here we are in R Factor 2, same car and track. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the graphics feel like you've regressed about 10 years into the past. Very flat color palette, very uh, very high contrast, but very low detail in R Factor 2. Now, of course, this isn't a crop of its latest PBR shaded content. This is one of their latest interior cockpits, so it's possibly a little bit unfair to the graphics of R Factor 2, so we'll hold off over judging too much here and just focus on the physics themselves. Now, as we drive through the outlap, one of the first things you'll notice about R Factor 2 is that the handling feels completely different to ACC, whereas ACC is very weighty and connected to the rear and feels almost kind of lumbery and like you've got 500 extra kilos that you're wrestling with, 
In R Factor 2, the car is extremely pivoty. I can push it into slides at 200 kph with no problem whatsoever. It's all about minor slips of the car, mid corner, even as you can see here on my outlap, and basically steering the car with the throttle from mid corner onwards. Coming into Aqua Minerale, very different experience here in R Factor. When you hit the brake, you basically jump into this controlled oversteer, which if you're good enough, you can maintain for excellent lap times. Now, whether or not this is particularly realistic to GT3 cars, I can't really say, but it is a very enjoyable and fun kind of driving style. Now, as we pass through the chicane there, one of the things you can notice is that R Factor 2 is far, far kinder to the undercarriage stuff, to the, to the bouncing, to the limit behavior than ACC is. The tires actually feel like they bounce, they feel springy, they feel soft. And this could be largely due to the game's physical time model. Of course, one of the reasons that R Factor 2 has been able to get by with such primitive graphics and sounds and such an inaccessible gameplay experience for so long is because of this legendary physical time model that they have. It makes the car extremely engaging to drive on the limit and certainly lets you get away with certain things in a far more realistic manner than other titles. Now, coming into our first hot lap, as you can see, the lines are very different. I'd go straight over the anti-cut in certain situations. As we go into oversteer coming out of the S's there, far, far easier to get the car sliding. And you'll notice that I'm driving in a far different way. There's way more rearward slip. There's way more on the throttle behavior here through the hairpin now. It's almost like driving an F1 car. You basically trail brake it in, keep the car rotating, then get on the throttle and just push it through that corner, slipping the rear the entire way through. Now here, we're not going to get any of that characteristic understeer. Car turns straight in as I get on the power, maybe a little bit later than I should have, pushing down towards Aqua Minerale again. It's going to be a very different experience to ACC. As the brake gets us rotating immediately, we follow through the rotation far, far gentler on the inputs there because it's so easy to get the car to spin out compared to ACC, which comparatively is so much more stable and understeery during that corner complex. Now the chicane again, way easier. Just munch those curbs, no problem. The car just bounces in a fashion that I, I personally find to be very, very realistic. As we head towards penultimate corners, braking, far easy to get oversteer here. We go over the curb, not a problem. You can see that I'm actually avoiding the curbing on the outside. Now, part of the reason for that is that because the time model runs at 2400 hertz, it actually renders every single ripple being hit by the tire. So the problem you run into is that it just, it's like glue, it's like flypaper. It wants to suck the car off the track. The lap was a 140.98. As we finish with a time of 140.9, almost a full second ahead of ACC, the first question on your mind had you seen our recent RR Factor 2's physics broken video was probably, am I using one of my aforementioned quote unquote physics hack setups for RR Factor 2? To which the unequivocal answer is, yes I am. So I'm going to guide you through what I did, why I did it, and how this is consequential in the overall physics experience of R Factor 2. So this is the setup for the McLaren 720S here in R Factor. As we've spoken about already in the R Factor 2's physics broken video, there are a few go-to things you can change on just about any new car setup in R Factor 2 to get it driving more quickly. Some of these are somewhat illogical, so bear with me. Bear in mind that the adjustments in blue are what I changed from the default, which is what's written in white. So we've obviously lowered the amount of fuel, 8 liters, enough for two laps. Nothing changed in the gear ratio. Nothing changed in the tires because they've come to start providing the car setups as defaults with the lowest tire pressures. Now in R Factor 2, pretty much every single time the lowest tire pressures will be the quickest, or at least the lowest allowable tire pressures will be the quickest. The camber's already fairly low on this setup. So we've increased the brake duct blanking to reduce drag on the car, fairly standard fare. Nothing particularly broken about that. Now in the suspension setup, we've increased the ride height ever so slightly to make the curbs a little bit easier on the car. We've neutralized the towing on the front to avoid scrubbing and heating up those tires any more than we have to. We've also increased the ride height on the rear to be commensurate with the front. Now what we've done is detach the rear sway bar completely. So from nine all the way through to detached and we've taken the towing on the rear down by one point to 0.117. This is to create a lot of stability in the rear of the car and I'm going to show you soon why that is. Moving to aerodynamics, we've taken the rear wing from P4 to P1, which is the lowest allowable setting. 
I actually went down in increments, P3, P2, then finally P1. Every single time I took it down a notch, the car simply got quicker lap times, it gained times on the straights, and the way that you actually offset that here in R-Factor land is by reducing the rear sway bar, or rather detaching it completely, and you can also reduce the camber on the rear tires in order to give you extra rear stability. Now, these two elements really shouldn't interact as they do, but unfortunately they do, and this is one of the, the major things you can do in order to gain massive time in R-Factor right now. The radiator tape went from 20% to 90%. Luckily, I didn't blow the engine, but that reduced the drag quite a lot. Would not recommend running that for a full race. With the electronics, we've taken the ABS all the way up to 11 because there are no disadvantages to the ABS in our factor. Just bury your foot in the brake pedal, it'll just stop quicker with less chance of lockup. And that is it for our setup. Let's move on to AMS2. And now for the latest and hopefully greatest, here we are in Automobilista 2, the latest addition to our slew of GT3 simulators. Now, of course, the McLaren 720S only came out a few weeks ago, Imola being one of the tracks that the title actually launched with. So as we come through the pits, I originally forgot to actually enable the pit limiter, so I kind of rushed out a little bit. As I play around with the steering, trying to find the differences between it and R-Factor and ACC, heading out of the pit lane now, first thing you notice is that graphically the game is actually relatively impressive, but the sounds probably slots somewhere in between R-Factor 2 and ACC in terms of quality. Not quite the same as ACC, but maybe not quite as anemic as R-Factor either. Now, you're probably noticing some interesting things as we go down these straights and get over these curves. The car has a very interesting rubber bandy feeling to it, almost as if it's running on a simplified R-Factor 2 physics model. Now coming around the hairpin there, I'm trying to feel out the car the steering in this game, the, the throttle and the brake inputs feel completely different to both R-Factor 2 and ACC. It very much has its own driving style. Now, that driving style makes it quite difficult to finesse on the limit. I actually had to get a setup from one of the, the world record holders for hot laps on this track in this car to get something relatively stable as a base to work from. One of the issues with AMS2 is that Trail braking is extremely difficult to do, even with a load cell brake pedal, as we are very, very careful over those. So as you can see, the car kind of bounces in a similar fashion to R-Factor 2, rather than just those broken movements of ACC, but they feel strange and simplified, and like the elasticity has been increased too much, almost like there's just a lack of nuance to everything. Now you can see I almost understeered there. I'm, I'm, not really feeling the car at the limit, so there's a lot going on with the force feedback in Automobilista 2, but not all of it is entirely communicative or what you feel like you might get from an actual car, so while there is a lot going on, it doesn't feel particularly engaging or lifelike in this car. As we finish our outlap and go for our first hot lap, braking hard down into the... Well, you can see this is one of the holdovers of the Project Cars 2 engine, the Madness engine, Lap time invalidated due to previous sector is something that we had to contend with for many, many years. As it appears to have carried over into AMS2, unfortunately. Coming into the S's, oh, overcorrecting. Overcorrecting there, because I just could not feel what the car was going to do with the limit. Very, very difficult car to drive on the limit. Again, somewhere in between ACC and R-Factor 2, but somehow more nebulous and vague than both. The best, best adjective I can use for AMS2's car handling is just weird. It feels surreal, almost as if it was rendered by somebody who had hoped to one day drive a, a car on the limit but had never quite done so. It just, it doesn't feel connecting to the driver. Even with a high-end sim rig, it's just very difficult to find the limits. It's very difficult to understand what the car's going to do, and it feels... Even though there's a lot of detail coming at you, not much of that detail is particularly useful. As you can see, I'm just continuously struggling with the car at the limit there. Now, I'm very happy because on the last half dozen or so laps, I've spun out by this point already. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, great. I'm going to finish the lap. It's going to all go great as we turn into this corner. And oh, almost an overcorrection there as the car just swings out on us. As we head towards the finish line, for a time that's assured to be far slower than both of the prior titles. 
We get a 144 flat or thereabouts. So we're going in for another lap just because we didn't feel convinced that that was all that we could do. I really want to make sure that I am as flattering or as fair as possible to all of these titles as I start to get a feel for these corners in AMS. Of course, a very different driving style, so I almost have to relearn what I'm doing in the other two sims to make it work in AMS. As you can see, it handles the anti-cut very well, but it forces the car into two wheels and it just kind of bounces in this very strange... I know people don't like this word, but borderline simcade way. It's just... It, it's almost like the handling in this title is a generation behind both R Factor 2 and ACC. It's just not on the same caliber, not on the same level. I'm constantly trying to feel for grip. I'm constantly trying to understand what the car is doing because it makes so little logical sense to me while I'm doing the driving. Again, through Aquaman Minerale as the car just almost goes into this strange lumbering slide like ACC, but almost unrecoverable. Tremendous amount of angle on the steering wheel required to recover that. And again, the, the curb pulling me in. Absolute disaster there on the chicane. <laughs> completely bizarre, completely bizarre spin there. Just very, very uh, not lifelike in my opinion, but that is what it is. AMS2 known as the, the quirky simulator at the moment still. Unfortunately, even though it's been months out of early access now, there's still a lot of work to go, especially on the tin tops. As you can see me again, overcorrecting on the car that just wants to spin out on me no matter what. It's the craziest, craziest handling style. And of course, this lap a complete disaster, possibly even worse than our very first hot lap. So probably a relatively honest experience of driving a tin top GT3 in AMS2 at the moment. It just... Compared to a title that's as dialed in and refined as ACC, it's the best adjective that can be used for it is weird and its limit behavior while it's trying to approximate that kind of physical dynamic time model thing that R Factor is doing, it just does it in the most bizarre way. It feels like you're playing Project Cars 2 more than it feels like you're playing something like R Factor. So again, just like the other two titles, we're going to jump into our setup to see what I actually had to do to try to stabilize this car somewhat, and I think you'll find it very compelling. This is one I have to admit I ripped off the number one world record time. Thank you, Nemesis69. Very much appreciated. I don't really know why you did most of the changes that you made, but the car was definitely more stable this way. So we'll just talk through it, me discovering it as much as I'm actually describing it to you guys. So I believe one point of uh, downforce was taken away from the default setup. Everything else looks more or less stock, including the brake bias. Steering lock, I think I moved up to make the car a little bit more sensitive. The tire pressures have been dropped in the rear by about 0.04 bar. I believe this makes the rear a little bit more stable and less likely to spin out under power. Brake pressure is lowered, which is kind of strange because normally you max out the brake pressure and lean on ABS in GT3 cars, so that's something new to me. Front duct opening and rear duct opening have been reduced as per the other two sims. Now this is where things get a little bit interesting. You can see here that the rear camber angle is minus 1.2 degrees, which is diminutively small with the fronts being over 2 degrees more. I mean, I've even, even by R Factor standards, that's quite excessive. I can only assume that this stabilizes the rear quite a lot because in AMS2, currently as it stands, as you saw in my playthrough, it's very, very easy to spin the car. It can be pretty easy to spin it out on power, but it's far, far easy to spin it out while trail braking unintentionally. So I guess you're doing everything you can to offset that spinning tendency. Now in terms of the drivetrain, we've got the boost pressure up as high as it'll possibly go, radiator opening as low as it will go without blowing the engine, and the TC and anti-lock brakes. So the ABS is actually quite high. I believe this is because it's very easy to lock the wheels in this and spin even easier. The traction control works in the opposite way. I believe the setup I got actually took it all the way down to 19, so you could really just stomp the throttle without fear of spinning out, but I actually increased it so the TC in this engine actually works inversely to the anti-lock brakes. This is a holdover from the Project Cars engine. The more TC you have, the less TC interference there is, but the more ABS you have, the more ABS interference there is. Don't ask me why they coded it that way. It's just what they did. So that concludes that. With all that out of the way, it's fair to say that we've already established some fairly stark differences between all three simulators. It's not at all outlandish to say that these constitute much of the forefront of next generation simulation for GT3 cars on the consumer market. AMS2 being a newcomer, it's obviously had the least time to dial in its processes, 
We're going to break down our comparisons across a few criteria to provide a clearer picture of just how these simulators compare to each other. Being visual creatures, the first thing which stands out to us whenever we see a new simulator is its graphical presentation. The differences between the three simulators are quite noticeable here and it's fairly easy to rate them based on their graphical fidelity. ACC, running on Unreal Engine 4, is notably the most detailed looking title of them all. While I don't always gel with the colour grading Kunoz opt to use, it's hard to dispute that ACC has the most detailed visual assets. This, unfortunately, comes with the caveat of ACC being the least optimised. Even with the GTX 3080, I still find it drops to noticeably low frame rates on certain scenes here at Imola, especially with external view and a full grid of cars. Optimization has been an issue for ACC since its outset, and unfortunately it hasn't come very far in this area. It's one for the sim racers with beefier rigs or those that don't mind sacrificing some of that graphical fidelity in order to get smoother gameplay. Further, the color grading at various times of day can be strange. The original Assetto Corsa had an array of different picture profiles, none of them providing a neutral or accurate color balance and only truly being fixed when Soul and custom shader patch mods did it. ACC unfortunately lies in a similar area. While the assets are very detailed and impressive, the visual presentation and tonal mapping feel somewhat muted and strange, especially during sunny weather. I would personally prefer a more neutral color balance that's more accurate to life, or in lieu of that, simply something like a HDR filter with expanded dynamic range so that it looks less muted. Automobilista 2 is built on the Madness engine, whose visuals I've always had a fondness for. Somehow, without overindulging on the amount of microscopic model detail, Automobilista 2 manages to look very rich, smooth and pleasant to the eye. While it doesn't contain the level of detail of ACC, you can make a case that it can look just as good visually under certain circumstances because of how well refined the engine is graphically. The amazing thing here is that AMS2 is also one of the top performers. I've been running AMS2 with an outdated GTX 1080 Ti since the outset and it's never dipped into noticeably stuttery frame rates, which for me is beneath 90 FPS. This is a completely maxed out settings at 1440p. With the GTX 3080, the performance is not even worth mentioning, it runs capped constantly. In fact, it's very likely I'll do any future AMS2 videos in 4K. AMS2 also has an amazing day to night transition cycle as well as a very pleasant colour grading, showcasing various zones of brightening and darkening across the track, corresponding with the position of clouds in the sky. Visually, it's absolutely stellar for 24-hour endurance racing. R-Factor 2 gets the short end of the stick here. Neither Imola nor the McLaren 720S contain their recent PBR shader upgrades to the engine. That aside, it's still fair to say that R-Factor 2 is the least impressive graphically. The older content looks very saturated and contrasty, giving it a cartoony presentation like it's a few generations behind graphically. That being said, R-Factor 2 has always had a good, neutral white balance which is very clear to see when you compare it to other sims of its generation such as the original Assetto Corsa and iRacing. People refer to R-Factor 2 as the blue-hued simulator but it only looks that way in contrast to the overly washed out yellow ones. To give R-Factor 2 more of a chance, you'll want to test it out with a new PBR shader content such as this, which raises its graphical prowess significantly. While it won't be knocking any doors down with its sheer beauty anytime soon, the latest content and interiors are a significant upgrade over what we've seen before, showing us how potentially flexible this aged engine is when used to its full potential. Normally, you would expect somebody to rate physics as important, if not more important than visuals in sim racing. However, since I'm a career sound engineer, we'll be delving straight into the sounds because to me they craft a major part of the immersive quality of the experience. ACC is the clear winner here. It's not even a contest. 
I wouldn't even be able to present it as such, even if I wanted to. It's the only title where the cars actually sound like they've been mic'd up from the source vehicles, rather than using synthesizer fakery and found audio to pass something off. The McLaren in ACC sounds very high fidelity. Passing through that sensation of V8 growl you'll be hearing resonating inside a largely empty, metallic cabin. Supplementing this, you have a distinct transmission whine and various mechanical whirs and clunks, the sound of tyres riding ripple strips, as well as various undercarriage scrapes and contortions are also clearly audible. It's almost as if you can hear the chassis flexing while it's under load. The sounds in AMS2 are best described as passable but not noteworthy. I constantly feel a sense that there are recycled sounds between cars simply to get them up, running and out the door. While the sounds are inoffensive and vaguely resemble the 720S GT3, I could swear I've heard the exact same transmission sound on other AMS2 cars. Of all the areas that R Factor 2 lags into modern simulators, one can make the case that the sounds are the foremost. While the graphics have received fairly regular updates since Studio 397 took charge, the sounds have largely fallen by the wayside and remain solely as placeholders. The 720S sounds bizarrely synthetic, artificially stretched and very unimpressive. Sort of like if a UFO tried to sound like a race car. This is the granddaddy category. If you're a true sim racer, this is what you care about above all else. It's also a very interesting category to analyze because all three simulators have very different and distinctive handling. In our original comparison between R Factor 2 and ACC, I concluded that while ACC took the crown for the smorgasbord of features, R Factor 2 still led in the physics department and would be my personal choice anytime. Coming into 2021 with all the change over the last several months, let's see if that's still the case or whether AMS2 has come in to shake things up. Assetto Corsa Competizione is most impressive not because of how tight an overall GT racing package it is, but rather because of how it was not that at all in the early days. It was borderline undrivable, with the physics engine not at all matching the requirements of the track fidelity Kunoz were pushing in Unreal Engine 4. There was no play at the limit, and cars would spiral off the track at the slightest suggestion of using curbs. What's most impressive about ACC is how far it's come over the last two years. What began with a fairly rudimentary porting of their physics code from the original AC evolved into a whole heap of nuance including a 5-point tyre model to better render curb behaviour, chassis flex to help with limit handling, and various tyre flex and contortion models to further help with car behaviour at extremes. That's not to mention the strides made in wet weather simulation, as well as the sensitivity of tyres to pressures, heat, and overdriving. ACC is one of the few sims where the car's mechanical and aerodynamic balance interact in a non-linear way. That is to say that you can't simply lower the drag on the rear wing, then offset the loss of grip by detaching the rear sway bar. There's a distinction between aerodynamic and mechanical grip, forcing you to be more sensible with car setups. This is not to say that there aren't or won't be exploits of its physics engine, but rather that they're becoming harder to achieve. Its notable ongoing drawback in the physics department is car handling at the limit. My personal feeling, based solely on a lot of prior experience with various sims, is that this could be overcome with a sufficiently well dialed in physical model on the tyres. While physical models present their own challenges, the potential advantages are myriad. While its driving feel has improved substantially over two years, ACC still has a weak spot at limit behaviour, with cars going into lumbering slides that take too long to recover from thus unincentivizing drivers from going to the absolute limit. Whereas in real life, a simple snap of the steering wheel may correct for rearward slip, in ACC there is a tendency for the slides to last longer than they should, robbing the driver of precious tents for daring to explore the extremes. <laughs> 
R Factor 2 could be called the diametric opposite to ACC's handling model. With an industry renowned physical tire model, it leads the way in driver feedback and limit feel. It's an extremely communicative physics engine, perhaps overly so, with much noise and detail needing to be smoothed out of its force feedback signals. The driving experience from a driver's perspective is extremely fun and engaging. It invites you to keep doing more and more laps, hence why the majority of my career in R Factor 2 simply consisted of Nordschleife hot laps. You can almost overlook its difficult online ecosystem and lack of user friendliness on account of the sheer joy of the driving experience. With this come the inevitable drawbacks. R Factor 2, for all of its handling glory, is based on fairly old physics code, leaving it susceptible not only to suspect driving styles, but also suspect car setups. We've explored this in some detail in the recent RR Factor 2's Physics Broken video, and followed it up earlier with our explanation of the 720S setup for Imola. Bear in mind that those setups were jigged up in less than 5 minutes. The intention was not to create a min-maxed esports grade setup, but rather to show how easy it is to gain time using the same basic tricks on almost every car. This is currently R Factor 2's Achilles heel. It never excelled at anything other than physics. And now that we've finally come to a point where the competition are catching up and R Factor's flaws are catching up with it, it finds itself in a very precarious position. While ACC has a very weighty, connected, dull feel, R Factor 2 is quite slidey and nuanced. It's very easy to push GT cars into miniature drifts at high speed and gain time by pushing the throttle through corners, rotating the rear of the car while doing so. It's fairly accepted at this point that many of the cars and models are not in fact driven this way in the real world. This makes it very difficult to take part in any online competitions where people aren't breaking the bounds of this physics engine, driving in a comical fashion for ultimate lap times. For a sim with R Factor 2's ambitions of being the most realistic simulator on the consumer market, this is a major flaw, one I hope to see addressed in 2021. AMS 2, what's to say? If the esports drivers in R Factor 2 use comical techniques to get fast lap times, then by comparison, AMS 2 is a traveling circus. The physics are just wrong. There are tremendous issues at the core of the simulation which for some reason have yet to be addressed by Reza. The Madness engine contains tremendous potential but so far has just shown us weird and wacky car behaviours, from dampers that act like bouncy castles, through the brake pedals that habitually spin the car, and bizarre limit behaviours that initially began with extremely easy to control slides, through to now having snappy and unpredictable behaviour in the GT3s. There's not much else to be said about the AMS2 physics other than that they need a tremendous amount of work. While it's commendable that Razer are working to populate their simulator with a lot of content, it ultimately doesn't mean anything if that content continues to drive as it has for the last year. This ties in very closely to the physics, but is distinctive enough to warrant its own section. Force feedback is a tremendously important element of racing simulators because it communicates not only the sensation of driving back at the virtual racer, but also the car's intentions. R Factor 2 has long been hailed the king of force feedback, and indeed it is very impressive in this criteria. Feeding the physics directly from its insanely nuanced tire model through the virtual column, R Factor 2 is extremely good at communicating both road detail and car intent to the driver. In some ways, this makes R Factor 2 the most intuitive driving simulator of them all. Equally impressive, the force feedback in this title feels remarkable from the lowest end gear driven wheelbases to the top end direct driven ones. ACC and force feedback have a very interesting relationship. Originally, I was not a fan of ACC's force feedback engine whatsoever, especially in the early days where it was overly damped and uncommunicative. This progressively began to change as both ACC updated its force feedback algorithms and I updated my sim rig to something far more high end. Every little upgrade was noticeable. Getting a Fanatec DD1 wheelbase unlocked a whole new layer of detail in ACC, further supplemented by a more rigid cockpit revealing yet more nuance. The cherry on top of all this came in the form of Fanatec's progressive driver and firmware updates, 
each unlocking yet more connection with the cars. It's not a good moral to this story, but essentially with ACC, what you invest in is what you get back. I only truly found the sim drivable and enjoyable once I invested many thousands of dollars into sim racing. I've not tried it on lower end hardware in some time, though I'd want to hope that their improvements to the physics code over the last year have improved its feeling even on lower and mid-range wheelbases. Automobilista 2's force feedback has gone through quite a few permutations. At certain points it felt quite good and communicative, while during others it just felt weird. After the most recent FFB rewrite, it's back in the feeling weird category again. No matter how I dial it in, I can't seem to get it to communicate meaningful forces without a lot of unnecessary extraneous detail. There is a lot happening in AMS 2's force feedback, but not very much of it is useful to the driver. I would advocate experimenting with the FX slider and damping in-game to fine-tune the force feedback to your needs, at least until they inevitably overhaul it again and undo all of your settings. Both ACC and AMS2 have fairly straightforward menu structures, making them fairly easy to navigate and configure for the average sim racer. Originally criticized for an extremely narrow spread of content, Kunoz have somehow managed to jam-pack everything GT related from the 2019 and 2020 GT World Challenge GT3 cars through to a bunch of extra tracks, a GT4 pack, and assorted additional cars such as the Lamborghini Huracan Trofeo and Porsche Cup car into ACC. While it's still a narrow spread of content in regard to being exclusively GT focused, that's also arguably its biggest advantage, as that focus has allowed them to really dial in the driving behavior of these cars rather than spread themselves too thin as developers. That said, the notable disadvantage here is that, being solely populated by licensed official content, ACC does not allow for any third-party modding. Originally starting with the quirky, niche content which defined the original Automobilista, AMS2 has recently begun pumping out more mainstream content such as modern GT cars, classic open wheelers, touring cars, classic GTs and everything in between. While their commitment to populating their game with content can't be faulted at present, one has to wonder whether the speed at which they're doing it isn't coming at a quality cost to the core of the simulation. R-Factor 2 was never known for its accessibility. From its infamous, archaic menu, through to the bizarre way in which packages operated with the core game in order to expand its function, it created a very clunky, segmented experience for the end user. Unfortunately, the new UI has not done very much to address this. Most features actually take more clicks to access than they did previously, with the new segmented, hyper-tabbed UI design, at this point it's fair to say that the user experience simply isn't R-Factor 2's strong point, nor is it likely to ever be. We may explore its new UI in more depth in a future video, but for the time being, we're happy to rest on the idea that, given how many years of development it's taken, it's somewhat underdelivered on expectations. In terms of sheer content, R-Factor 2 can't be beaten here. Being the oldest title from 2013, that's to be expected. The sheer wealth of content not only available officially since Studio 397 took the reins, but the vast array of modded content on the Steam Workshop and beyond makes it a true open simulator with racing of all kinds. It also tends to be the endurance simulator of choice for multi-class racing across 24 hours. This is a tricky category, because AI currently don't think like human beings and have to be coded with approximate behaviours. In that sense, no AI is perfect and it becomes more a matter of personal preference. Hopefully, neural networks allow us to bridge that gap a little more in the new decade, but for the time being, this is where we are. Out of the box, Automobilista 2 has the worst AI by far, without a shadow of a doubt. Its AI is just bizarre. The rubber banding is so intense that you cannot get a proper one-to-one -one race against similarly BOP'd opponents. You can completely crush them on slower corners, only to inevitably lose them on corner exit every time. They swerve and sway wildly, seemingly leaving their lines for no conceivable reason. The best way to characterize AI in AMS2 is as broken, 
ACC on the surface has good AI, seemingly able to follow the racing line without too many issues. On the other hand, I have a mega compilation reel of all the times they've pit maneuvered me during a race, seemingly unaware or uncaring of my presence as they took their desired line through the track. In fact, by the time I worked out you could remove safety ratings from single player races, they'd already decimated mine. Their performance is quite variable. While on Imola, they're quite easy to crush, even set to 100. On other tracks, they'll consistently outperform the real life lap record, even on more moderate settings. I would characterize ACC's AI as raceable but flawed. As long as you give them space to operate, you should get by most of the time, but it won't save you from the odd occasion I'll decide to spin you just for fun. R-Factor 2's AI is crazy. On one hand, it drives bizarrely with either maximum or minimum inputs as if driving on a keyboard, visible whenever you spectate an AI car internally, the infamous blinking brake lights also being a giveaway of how it's coded. On the other hand, if you delve into the player.json file and tweak some of the AI parameters, causing the field to spread out more in regard to skill and enable them to make occasional mistakes, they can actually give you some truly dynamic racing in a way that the ACC and AMS2 AI simply cannot. Add to this that R-Factor 2's AI actually teach themselves as they lap, and you get some truly interesting behaviors. Ultimately, you must let the AI run at least a few qualifying laps so that their running order lines up according to their skill. This will get rid of the majority of the lap 1 disasters. You then compound this with the additional factor of AI behavior being largely dependent on the AIW of any given track. All kinds of behaviors can be modeled such as standard dry line, standard wet line, blocking line, etc. Once dialed in on certain third-party modded tracks with strong AIW, I've had some amazing races in R-Factor 2, truly, the best in all of sim racing. Cars blocking me on the inside, meanwhile making moves on each other and racing hard but fair. Yet other times, it was a complete disaster. That's the insanity of R-Factor 2's AI. It can either be brilliant or woeful, with very little in between. Then come the flag rules. You literally cannot drive a single player race with yellow flags enabled. Much of the time, this will result in a perpetual full course yellow until the race ends. While this is well known in the community, it unfortunately puts a lot of the newer players off. ACC and R-Factor 2 work on the classic, dedicated server model for multiplayer. That is, you either need to find a pre-existing open lobby or an organized competition or league race in order to get any multiplayer racing done. This can be fine for the more dedicated people, but not so good for those looking to race privately with their friends. Automobilista 2 comes in packing private lobbies, which are extremely easy and straightforward to set up. The caveat is that virtually nobody is racing it online at present. With the highly variable content and constant changes to the physics engine, it's difficult to create a solid ground for an online community to grow. There is no competition or safety rating system in place at present, though the developers have voiced the desire to implement both in the future. It's fair to say that R-Factor 2 had the most underdeveloped online system, with multiplayer needing to be accessed separately through the game's launcher up until recently. The developers' rollout of the new competition system is looking to breathe some more life into an otherwise stagnant online ecosystem, so we can only keep our eyes peeled and hope for the best. ACC, despite having its player count fluctuations, has managed to fight back and have a relatively vibrant online community, considering how niche and specific the content is. There are quite a few people racing online in GT3s, if not so much GT4s, and you can usually find an open lobby to have a race in. This is supplemented with a rudimentary safety rating system. As a quick plug, in order to get more organized and mature racing, some of us content creators have jumped on simracing.gp, allowing us to host regular events for our communities on private servers in AC and ACC, and very soon Automobilista 2 as well. Hopefully R-Factor 2 will join us on the platform eventually. If you're interested in joining our Sim Racing Legends community, find the link down below.
believe me when I say that this comparison ended up being far longer than I intended. Originally, it was meant to be a fun, basic drive-through of each simulator using identical content, sharing some short words on how they differ from one another. While we did still squeeze that in, the back end allowed us to express some more nuanced ideas about the state of each simulator and how they rate alongside one another across some very specific criteria. If you've watched the entire video up until now, you've likely already noticed the pattern forming. It turns out that the main difference between now and 9 months ago is that ACC has only further entrenched its position as the overall best packaged GT simulator. It already had the audio visuals, the accessibility and all the licenses, and now it's progressively also catching up on the physics front. While it's not perfect, after all, no sim is, it's quite clearly the best overall package for GT racing coming into 2021. Whereas R Factor 2 could once coast by on the strength of its physics engine, it's now sadly being left behind across most criteria. In some ways, it is still my personal favourite simulator and I would love to see it unquestioningly retake its crown as the most realistic consumer sim. It will, however, take a concerted effort on the part of the developers to deep dive into their physics engine and truly take it to the next level. Automobilista 2 has yet to find its market. It feels confused, ushering out swaths of new content on a regular basis but not dialing any of it in to drive particularly well. It feels like a title without a clear direction and definitely without the dialed in physics to box at the same level as ACC and R Factor 2. If you enjoyed this overly lengthy and verbose dissertation on three of the leading simulators of our generation, feel free to hit the subscribe button and join us for future videos. Until then, we'll see you later.